very fine. And he done some silk talking. I know. They so, that. so I just. Doesn't sound like it's on. Not on. Um, yes. We'll, we'll start a little bit. Wait a few minutes. We'll wait a few minutes and then start. <coughs> <coughs>
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our thought leader panel on the role of the central office in teaching and coaching principles, something very dear to my heart on a personal level. And um, I'm going to introduce, I'm Karen Butterfield, by the way. I'm a consultant with Learning Forward and also with CCSSO. So it's great to be with all of you. And it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, Max Silverman uh, to my left at the far end is the Associate Director of the Center for Educational Leadership, better known as CEL, at the University of Washington. Max is a former principal and central office leader who leads CEL's work focused on district leadership. In this role, Max has worked closely with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a number of districts, including Seattle, Shelby County in Tennessee, and in Minneapolis. Stephen Fink, on the other end of the table here, is the executive director of the University of Washington's Center for Educational Leadership and is an affiliate associate professor of educational leadership and policy issues in the University of Washington's College of Education. He has worked extensively with school and district leaders on improving the quality of instructional leadership. Prior to coming to the University of Washington, Steve spent 12 years as an assistant superintendent in the Edmonds School District and was a principal and special education teacher in Idaho and in Los Angeles. Steve is the co-author with Anique Markholt of Leading for Instructional Improvement, How Successful Leaders Develop Teaching and Learning Expertise. I would also like to introduce our additional panelists who are in the trench, coaches and supporters of principals in their districts. Kim Peach, sitting next to Max, is the executive leadership coach of Hillsborough County Public Schools. And Dr. Judith White is the instructional director of Prince George's County Public Schools. And I thought it would be nice to have each of them provide a little bit of their backgrounds and their current roles within their districts. And then we will get started with uh, the panelists' presentation. I would like to remind folks who came in after we got started that there are folders of information on today's um, presentation up towards the, the beginning rows. That's what I'd like to encourage you to keep moving up. And um, with that, and then we'd like to save the last 10 minutes, and we're starting a few minutes late, but we want to save the last 10 minutes for Q&A. All right, so with that, I'll let you all get started. Thank you. Hi again, my name is Judy White, and I'm currently an instructional director with Prince George's County Public School System here in uh, the Washington metropolitan area. So we are excited that you are in our hometown um, and hopefully enjoying yourselves. I, I've, this is my 22nd year in Prince George's County. I started as a special education teacher, became an academic coordinator, um, an assistant principal, a principal for seven years in our district, and now I have the wonderful opportunity to serve our students through the lens of coaching principals. So I'm responsible for 13 principals in our district. All 13 of my schools um, are highly ESOL populated, and I also have four early childhood centers. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I get to engage in this work and work with our central office teams on how to make the work of the principalship that much greater. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, switch. <laughs> Hi, hello everybody, I'm Kim Peach. Um, I'm from Hillsborough County, Florida. Uh, so it's great to be here with you and certainly enjoying this weather. Um, I am currently an executive leadership coach. I'm um, going on my third year in that capacity. I, my primary responsibility is coaching year one and two principals as well as providing other principals support. Um, I was a principal for eight years and an assistant principal for four and I was an elementary teacher um, prior to that. So my role um, is to help develop leaders in our pipeline. I work with our Future Leaders Academy throughout our principal induction program in developing um, and providing professional development. So thrilled to be here with you all this afternoon. 
Okay, <clears throat> and, I, and I echo that too. It's great to be here. Let me just also reiterate what Karen said, that we have wonderful reading materials up in about the first three or four row, rows, so I encourage you all to, to come on up if you can. So of over 13,000 school districts across the country, when we think about uh, the role of the central office and ask ourselves, uh, you know, does the central office have a role in these districts? I mean, I, for, to me, I think that argument is long over. I think that the fact of the matter is that uh, central offices do exist. We have over 13,000 of them. Every day, central offices are playing a role in the development of teachers and the development of leaders. And so to me, the real question is, what kind of role? And in particular, how are central offices supporting the development of their school principals as instructional leaders, understanding that schools are a most critical unit of change. And so that's the focus of the next hour. We're gonna move through some information that, uh, that we think is quite germane to this topic, invite our panelists to comment on it, and hopefully leave time at the end for you all to uh, ask some questions. First, I wanna share just a few of, a uh, little bit about who we are as the Center for Educational Leadership and some critical ideas that undergird the work we do, and I think the work that uh, the central office leadership role rests upon. So we are a not-for-profit service arm of the School of Education at the University of Washington. Our mission is the elimination of the achievement gap. For us, what that means is of the many different entry points for that gap, and there are many, as you know, for us, we concern ourselves with those that we think we have the most leverage over, which is really the improvement of teaching and learning. So we do lots of work to support building very effective and successful teachers. We do lots of work building in, in successful and effective principals and building successful and effective central office leaders. And ultimately, if we're serious about the achievement gap, then we have to concern ourselves with issues of equity. And so we concern ourselves with issues of equity every day, as I know that you, or you do as well. And because for, for us, and everybody in this room and everybody at this conference, it's not a matter of some kids achieving well, it's really a matter of how do we help each and every child achieve to his or her fullest potential. I wanna run through some foundational ideas that we work off of as a center, but I really want you to think about these within the topic frame of today around the role of the central office in supporting principals as instructional leaders. So the first is that if students aren't learning, they're not being afforded powerful learning opportunities. You know, everything else notwithstanding, the quality of teaching matters a lot, right? And so if the quality of teaching matters a lot, how does the central office think about that in terms of what do our school principals need to know and be able to do to improve the quality of teaching? Especially understanding that it's really complex and sophisticated, right? I mean, We've been educating some kids well for several hundred years in this country. That has never been the issue. The real issue is how do we educate all of our kids well? And this is highly complex and highly sophisticated. One of the things we know about sophisticated and complex endeavors is that it improves when it's open, we call it for public scrutiny, when it's practiced in a culture of public reflection, public collaboration, I refer to this as uh, the National Football League Monday, right? Or, or if you're a Washington Redskin fan or a Dallas Cowboy fan, then Tuesday because the first thing they did today is watch the film from last night's game. And we have many professions, not just sports, but other, other professions that routinely open their practice up for inspection, for scrutiny, for reflection, and they work together in collaborative settings to investigate and examine their practice. And so as a central office leader then, the question to ask yourselves is, oh, you know, what kind of culture do we have in our district to enable this kind of public practice to take place? We certainly know that schools and classroom teachers are isolated, but I would argue, and I think you know, our panelists could, could chime in, that historically the role of the school principal has been equally isolated. All of this really rests on probably the most critical concept that we're gonna continue to come back to today, and that's this notion of reciprocal accountability, which means that if we're gonna hold our principals accountable for something, 
we have to ensure they have the knowledge, expertise, and skills to do what we're asking them to do. Right? Simply to rate their school on a report card and rate their performance on a report card, absent of what we really know about what their expertise is and where their knowledge and skills lie, is wholly inadequate in, in order to improve their performance and in order to prove, improve the success of uh, teaching and learning across the system. So this requires a particular kind of leadership and, and a somewhat different kind of leadership. Certainly, we're all statutorily obligated to do the traditional kinds of monitoring, the kinds of evaluation, and things like that. But the real question is, how, are you as a, how is your central office and how are your, those, of, those in your central office who are directly supporting and supervising principals, how are they working day in and day out to ensure principals have the knowledge and skills to do what we're asking them to do? And just, I'm just curious for a show of hands, how many, how many either current principals or previous principals in the room, anybody? So, so you all know that this job is, you know, almost next to impossible, right? I mean, it's, it's been many years since I've been a principal and, and I can only imagine, you know, trying to enter that principalship today under all of the, the pressures and expectations that exist. And finally, another foundational idea is this, not, this notion that we can't lead what we don't know. And so if we expect principals to lead the improvement of teaching and learning, the next question that we need to concern ourselves with is, so what do they know about teaching and learning? And for us, we have this, uh, what we call our two-part leadership equation, which is first and foremost, we call it instructional anatomy, right? Just like uh, we would never go to a doctor that does not know human anatomy, right? If your doctor didn't know the difference between the endocrine system and the nervous system, you probably wouldn't be a very good doctor. Uh, and so we really want to focus on, so what's the corollary there? And we think there's an ent entire body of knowledge around what we call instructional anatomy, which is the anatomy of what high quality teaching and learning looks like. And we advocate that at a minimum, school leaders need to know this and know this well. And while that's necessary, it's also insufficient. Because just like a good doctor that knows the human anatomy it doesn't make the doctor good unless the doctor has a whole host of other skills and abilities, right? And so that's the real key is how do we seize upon the instructional anatomy and build leaders capable of leading in ever more complex and challenging times. So with that, I wanna bring Max up and he's gonna lay out the, the leadership challenge we've been wrestling with in a very exciting project over the last couple of years. Uh, thank you, Steve. Boy, I'm glad some of you got here early to get, to get the good seats, because uh, who knows, as people stream and what could happen. So, so we're excited to be here today, as, as Steve said, to really share with you uh, what we've been learning uh, in our work about what we think is a particular leadership challenge that you all face. Steve said, leaders can't lead what they don't know, right? And we're, we're finding, and I think you would agree that, first of all, I think we all agree principals can positively influence what happens in classrooms. Secondly, we also know if, if, if the research out there is, is correct, on average, principals are only getting three to five hours a week on activities that we know currently through research improve instruction. And add that on to what Steve just said about you know, this, lead, this type of leadership is, is really, just like teaching is complex and sophisticated, so is this type of leadership. And whenever that happens, for those of you in the central office, you really have a responsibility, as Steve, as Steve said, to provide folks what they need. And we're gonna argue today that your principals need three main things from you. Clarity about their role, development to do it well, and a set of strategic supports that allow them to, to spend more than three to five hours a, a week uh, doing the important work. And so what we're gonna share with you is a result of a project we've had with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Leading for Effective Teaching. And through that, we've been working with 11 school systems across the country uh, for the past three and a half years on this issue of uh, developing leaders. We've also, uh, our center worked with a number of districts across the country side by side with them 
helping them to figure out the role of the central office in supporting principals as instructional leaders. And just to give you a little finer edge on like what this challenge looks like from the principal point of view, this survey is only two years old from MetLife, but we know that 75% of principals feel their job has become too complex, and almost 70% say that their job has changed even in just the last five years. And so if you're a central, I mean, that's really hard if you're a principal, but we're here looking at it from the central office point of view in that what do central office leaders do to help principals day in and day out? And so to help solve that uh, dilemma for central office leaders, as part of our Gates project, we created what we call the Principal Support Framework. And it's in your folders. If you don't have a folder, a little bit later you can come up here and, and, uh, and, and grab one. But the Principal Support Framework, not only does it look really pretty, it lays out for you in three different action areas a vision of what central office leaders do to support principals. Secondly, it lays out a series of guiding questions uh, to, to guide your work as well as vision statements for what it looks like. And so the principal support framework, as I said, calls out the three things that principals most need from you. A vision of what their work looks like day to day, uh, a system, a true system for supporting their development, and then thirdly, uh, strategic supports to help them do it. So we're just gonna quickly walk through what we've learned in each action area and have uh, Judith and Kim keep sharing from their perspective how this is going in their districts. So action area one, as I said, just calls out the need, and I'll emphasize, for a shared vision of principals as instructional leaders. And what this means to us is, once you have a shared vision, the rationale for this is, this is what then, without a shared vision, I'll, I'll say it the opposite, without a shared vision, Principals won't have the clarity they need on what they're supposed to do day in and day out, what the system values. You won't have the clarity you need to develop professional learning in a systematic way, to assist and measure, uh, to assess and measure principal performance, as well as to drive the hiring of the right candidates for what you believe the principal's work is. Oh. Well, the good news is we're, I mean, the bad news for you all is we're out of folders, which means there's, there's a nice crowd here. Uh, at the end of the session, if you like, if you just uh, give us your name and email, we will make sure that you get all of the materials from the session. So the first action error really calls out the things that central offices do to make sure, again, that not only principals have clarity, on what their day-to-day -day work is, but that those in the central office have clarity on what principals do day in and day out. And here's a few key things that we've learned. The first thing that we've learned is your evaluation frameworks are actually insufficient for the task of giving principals actual clarity on the work day-to-day. -day. That's not to say you don't need evaluation frameworks or an evaluation system for principals. It's just to say, that if your framework has 24 elements, or 26 elements, or upwards of 30 elements, that's too many to drive the day-to-day -day work of principals. They need to be thinking about three to five things that you have declared are the most important things they, they do day in and day out. And so we call those three to five things power standards. And we have nice examples. Uh, we worked with the Pittsburgh Public Schools. They came up with five power standards from their 28 elements. Uh, AUSL schools in Chicago did the same thing. And with those power standards, what they found was goal setting and performance improvement efforts became much more clear. They were able to wrap their arms around what they were helping their principals get better at. Their principal pipeline efforts got a lot, a lot easier because they knew specifically what they were developing people to do and then they let this drive their principal selection and hiring process so that they were, they were actively seeking the folks who could do the things they felt would make the most difference for uh, their students and teachers. And then lastly, the other thing we're learning is once you develop this, you have to communicate it constantly. We have lots of people who have these things hanging on their walls or in a folder, but if you don't communicate it constantly across the whole central office, and to the principals, it's quickly going to uh, evaporate into the ether, and people will quickly be asking, what is it we're supposed to do? 
And so we've, uh, we've asked uh, Kim and Judith here because they really, their districts really are national leaders in this work. So our, our, our first question for them is, how has your district gone about creating clarity and consensus for the principal role, as well as what are you most in, and least clear about in this role? Okay, well, I'll get us started. Can you hear me? This was the good one. Oh, there it is, it's on, thank you. Um, so we worked really hard, as Max was saying, they, they called them power standards, but we worked on, we call them competencies in Hillsborough County Public Schools. So we worked really hard on developing five main competencies. There are 35 indicators, but those competencies really drive our work. So the principals write goals with, their, uh, area, with our area superintendents. They write action steps, they write how they're gonna be measured, um, and all that work is driven from those original five competencies. It, they drive all the work we do in our pipeline from our FLA to our um, preparing new principal program. All that PD is developed around the competencies. In addition to that, in our small group meeting, um, or small groups, we're, we're a huge county, first of all, Hillsborough County. We're the eighth largest in the, in the nation. Um, so we're broken up into eight smaller groups. And in each of those smaller groups, we have an area leadership team. And so that team looks at each of the principal's goals, and we design PD that is aligned with their goals. So they get that development within the small group. And then when we follow up with our principal site visits to the schools, we again, those leadership competencies, principal goals, drive our work. And so what we're unclear about still, I would say, um, I can only pick one thing. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, um, I would say, you know, be, being such a huge district, um, I think gaining the clarity and the systems thinking around how do, it, how do we get our different silos in our central office all to have clarity around our principal competencies. So messaging that, um, communicating that very clearly is the work that we're, going, we're doing this year. Judith? So we too have leadership standards. Our district has eight. Uh, but this year, we've been very deliberate, actually over the last two years, we've been very deliberate about our school improvement process and our model. So uh, some of you may have heard of the data-wise process. This, we are probably one of, uh, if only one, district that is currently using it district-wide. So not only are our schools focused on moving the work, but we're doing that also in every department, which helps to break down the silos so that departments understand what schools are looking at and how to make decisions based on data. Um, also, for the very first time, we have a coherence framework that we use in our district. We open every single meeting at every, every meeting, no matter whose department, uh, with the coherence framework. And really breaking apart the coherence framework for our staffs to understand and really getting them to look at everything through the lens of culture, stakeholders, stri system structures, and resources whenever they're making a decision. And again, that's both school and central office. And so this year we talk about power standards. The three biggest rocks we have in our district for every principal, and every principal knows this, is to function from the literacy plan. We think of literacy sometimes just as our reading and language arts, but literacy for our district is across every single content. And so what does that mean? And we've created a plan that breaks that out and breaks out the shifts so that we're preparing all of our students for college career readiness. Uh, again, our data-wise process, so what does the work look like? How do we do it? How do we build and organize together and move the work? Looking at what our students struggle with, our learners, what we struggle with, and then really building action plans based on evidence at a very, very low level of inference. And then our evaluation process, so how do we provide bite-sized feedback quickly to move practice so those are the three power standards that you will hear. And on top of that, our instructional directors who are the supervisors, we meet every single Friday. And those meetings are to calibrate us to all go out to 206 schools to lead the same work the best way we can in the same manner across our district. Okay, thank you. You know, just as a, a postscript to this action area, uh, one of the things, you know, and Max really hit strongly of, of this whole uh, notion and the critical issue of clarity. One of the things that we found in the, the work when we were supporting these districts around the country, and we were somewhat surprised by it, is that there really wasn't, I mean, in some cases, you know, the Hillsboroughs and the Prince George's, I think that, you know, there are bellwethers and outliers, but in so many cases, there wasn't consensus agreement on, you know, what are those eight to 12 
most critical practices principals should be doing every day to improve teaching and learning. And so some of those districts challenged us since, the, you know, since we're a public university, why don't you guys create something? And so we did. So for those of you who have a folder, you'll see in your folder something called the Four Dimensions of Instructional Leadership. And it was our attempt uh, to do a pretty thorough view, review of the research and come up with what we, you know, we have four critical dimensions and there are some sub-dimensions of what we think are the highest levers for improving teaching and learning. And if you don't have a folder, you know, one thing I want to you know, really reiterate, at everything that we talk about is available. You can download it and go onto our website. There's no cost, because as a public university, we always seek to, to make our materials public. And so uh, the things that we're going to mention today, uh, we encourage you to get to that website and, and download it. And you're welcome to do so. So with that, I'm going to move to action area two. So now we've establish clarity, right? You, you're clear on what are those eight to 10 to 12 power standards that you expect every principal to know and be able to do every day. So the next question is, how do you cause that to happen? Right? What are you doing as a system to develop your principles as instructional leaders and to enable them to, actual, to, to actualize these standards every day? And as a rationale, one of the things that you know, we've discovered over the years working in this is that the traditional methods and modes of supervision is really insufficient to lever the improvement of practice. You, you know, we, we would argue from our experience, and I think some research would support this, that you can't monitor and evaluate your way to improvement. Right? It, just, it's just not, it, it may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. The second thing we have found is that principal professional development, and particularly in larger districts, is often outsourced, it's often very topical in nature, and it's led by multiple departments operating in many cases out of different silos, and in many cases silos that don't speak to each other. Right. And at the end of the day, there are actually few intensive and uh, intentional job embedded opportunities to improve instructional leadership skills, something that is actually embedded in the daily practice of principles. And then there's even fewer formal opportunities for principals to collaborate together to improve their practice. Right, sound familiar? Like teachers don't have time to collaborate or haven't historically, and we would argue the same with principals. So the first thing in action area two is to shift the role of the principal supervisor to a more primary role of a teacher and a coach. Yes, a principal supervisor in most cases, not all, but in most cases, they are the statutorily obligated um, evaluator, and that's fine. We don't, we don't actually believe there's an, an inherent conflict in that, but we do believe that at the end of the day, the role of the principal supervisor needs to shift dramatically to what does it mean to teach and coach this principal in the spirit of reciprocal accountability. If you think about, we call this a reciprocal through line, right? The way we want our teachers to know our students as individual learners so that they can differentiate their supports is the same, way, same we, way that we want our principals to know their teachers, which is the same way we want our principal supervisors to know principals as is individual learners so they can differentiate support. That said, the principal supervisor, and you know, I and I know others will speak more to this in a moment, can't do everything. And so we need to think of even a broader system of support for developing principals. And then this whole idea of principal agency, which is how do we create a culture and a, an environment where principals have more and more opportunities to direct their own learning. I think one of the things we're seeing from the work in teacher leadership and the research around that is the more we can give teachers uh, opportunities and, and develop their agency to support and promote and direct their own learning, the better, and, that's, and we would argue the same for the principals. So some of the things that, that we're learning here around principal supervisors, and, and I think this is really important, is that we, we would say that certainly a principal supervisor needs to know the role of, of being a principal well, and that means most likely they sh probably should have been a successful principal. Maybe it's not an absolute must. But the critical thing here is just because somebody is a good principal doesn't mean they, or I hate to use the word good and bad, just because somebody 
has been an effective principal doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be an effective principal supervisor. There is an entirely different skill set to learn around that. And so one of them is, you know, yes, we need to have a deep understanding of instructional practices, we need to have a deep understanding of leadership practices, and we need to have a deep understanding of the adult teaching and coaching skills and really understanding adult learning theory and how adults learn. And those are some things that we think are rather critical when you're looking at uh, recruiting and hiring principal supervisors. All too often what we have found is that um, somebody has been a super successful principal in a building, great test scores, the community loves him or her, and it's like that person's going to be a great principal supervisor without really being mindful of what's the skill set this person needs to learn and know and be able to do to actually be an effective principal supervisor. And then the final part is really around this broader system of support for that because the principal supervisor can't do, do it all him or herself. And, and one of the things that, that actually worries me and you know, Max and I and our colleagues at the center have talked about this. You know, there's, there's a growing widespread what we'll call principal supervisor initiative out in the country with, with this notion that, wow, the principal supervisor role matters. Yes, we agree. Uh, and the span of control matters, which means that we need to get their span of control to something that's manageable. A principal supervisor supervising 50 or 75 principals is not necessarily a manageable load. Let's get that down to eight or 10. But what we would argue is even that is not, is not completely sufficient to develop and support pr all that principals need in order to be effective instructional leaders. And, and we need to make sure we don't fall into this trap of the principal supervisor as like the hero. You know, one role cannot do it all. It, it really requires uh, the principal supervisor being sort of nested in a larger system of supports. And action area three, Max will talk more about that. But I want to actually get to a panel question because they have some great experience with this question. So for our panel, beyond revising the principal supervisor role, how is your district building a coherent professional development system, including coaching and mentoring opportunities for principals? So currently, um, I, my span of control is 13 schools, and uh, for every instructional director in our district, it's between 13 and 15. And this year, I have four new principals, one brand new school opening. So you have to really be strategic on what the needs are and understanding. You also have to come from a frame of, um, because I was a successful principal, I don't want my principals to lead the way I lead. I want my principals to lead the best way they can. And so my number one job is to, we work a lot with Gallup Strength Finders and knowing their top five strengths and really getting them to understand how to work through their strengths to be the best leader they can. We've also done a lot of work with mentoring matters, and it's really talking about those stances of coaching. So calibrating, collaborating, um, consulting, and um, coaching. And so I might have a new principal, and I coach, 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 and consulting. Like, I'm just telling them, they call me and in a crisis, do this. And then you wait for after the crisis ends to go back in and coach so that the next time they get in that same situation, they have the skills and the tools to work their way through. I might have a seasoned principal where I'm um, collaborating. We're at the table. We're working through it together. So you have to really know your principles and know and understand what stance to be in as you move that work. Um, again, I told you that our instructional directors meet with the asso three associate superintendents every single Friday. And part of that work is to build us in our questions. And we bring problems of practice and we practice on each other and we are constantly figuring out how to ask the right questions what's our entry point planning for the visit you can't just show up in a school and, and expect to impact their work you have to plan for that before you enter in um, we also do a lot with cross-functional teams in our district so uh, dr. Fink talked about principals not having that time to plan together. So this year, our model from our summer institute has been at every single professional development we have in our district, we will engage them in the work and there will be time in that session to work with their colleagues to plan for going back into their building. We know so quickly we can give, 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 and the moment they get back in the building, it all sounds great, but when they walk in the door and life happens, everything we gave them can fall away. So you have to provide the time for them to plan and evaluate and rethink and reflect 
on those things that are gonna actually make a difference in their building. Um, I think it's so important to coach them through every situation and to hold their feet to the fire to things, you know, we could have a million reasons why we don't, but we have to learn and teach and help them plan how to be successful in this work. Um, the other thing that we're doing in our district is we're building our AP and principal pipeline programs. We're really providing opportunities for um, people to be out shadowing to really understand the aspects of sitting in that seat because we know it's a lot. Uh, everybody's like, oh yeah, I wanna be a principal. Then you become a principal and it's like, oh my God, I had no idea that all these things were happening every day. So just providing that time. And our, our district, lastly, is doing a lot with succession planning. So we've sent 15 principals to a leadership development program, learning how to do our job and they'll shadow us and the instructional directors currently are going through a succession plan to work in different offices in our district. All that becomes so important when we think about central office and them learning how to support the work at the school. We can't expect our principals to be super fabulous when our departments have no alignment to what's taking place in their buildings every single day and the impact that they have towards that work. Okay, thank you. All right, we do a lot of work with coaching in Hillsborough County. Um, it's, it's big belief system of ours. So we start all of our principals in Hillsborough County, which there are a lot of brand new ones. Our year one and two principals all are assigned a principal coach. And for the first year of the principalship, they are coached up to 90 minutes once a week. And that coaching um, is done by a professionally trained coach, certified coach, such as myself. Um, we go through a pretty rigorous training um, through New Teacher Center, and a lot of that work is focused around blended coaching. And so that coaching can look like it can be instructional. A lot of it is in the beginning, right, in their first year when they're just, just trying to keep their head above water, to the second year where we really try to move them into more of the transformational type leadership. And the second year, the coaching is ev done every other week. So every one of our principals pre um, gets that assistance. In addition, they go to something called principal induction program. So as that group of year one and year two principals, they go to training about six a year during the day where they're um, presented on a topic that aligns with our competencies and they are provided content, but then they're also provided the time to collaborate with each other after. So I have seen, something I've seen personally, because I'm in this job now for about three years, is I have seen a real shift in our principals. Where in the beginning, you know, they're pretty isolated and you might have had, you know, one or two friends and you kind of hung out and you talked, but now, because we're being systematic about this work of training them and providing them opportunities to collaborate, you see them reaching out to each other, you see them sharing, you see them sharing best practices. It has that whole different feel like, you know, we're in this together and we're gonna make it together. So it's really exciting to see the work progress throughout the district and to see especially our newer principals really come out strong and then make each other even stronger. Um, we also use Gallup in our district. I'm a Gallup certified um, strengths coach, so we try to do a lot of that. That's part of our onboarding of our new principal program. Um, onboarding could be a whole other topic we could talk about, but we, we take a lot of time to onboard our principals. And so through that onboarding, we do Gallup assess them on their strengths and work with those strengths throughout the two years to help guide them in making good decisions. Um, and I think then lastly, again, as I mentioned earlier, in order to get support because the area soups can't do it alone, right? I have 10 principals that I coach year one and year two as a principal coach, but my area soup has 30 principals. So he has an area leadership team. And again, there's somebody from CNI on the team, somebody from PD is on the team, I am on the team, someone from ESE is on the team. And so we strategically look at the schools that are in our area and we make visits to those schools we coach with the principal, we talk with them, we provide as much support, and we, we, may, we have made it so is an organic program, so that they are part of the decision making and the discussion is what help do they need. And of course we always have you know, their leadership goals, which are based on the competencies there to help guide those um, conversations to help provide support to the principals. What, what's been fun for us in this journey of, uh, I joined Cell, uh, I'm in my seventh year at Cell, and I actually went there to, to really help figure out alongside with the UW researchers, like what's the central office supposed to be doing? And so you'll, you'll see, if, for those of you who got a copy of the principal support framework, we're, we're in version two. And version two has really been revised based on what we've learned from places like Prince George's County and Hillsborough County. And what's been fun for us, uh, Steve mentioned the principal supervisor initiatives. And 
you know, we get a little nervous now, even though we talk a lot about principal supervisors, but when we, uh, a school district calls us and says, hey, we want to help our principals, we're going to do a principal supervisor initiative. And we get really nervous that they're going to sink a lot of money into one position and assume that's all principals need. And on the flip side, if you went out to a principal and said, what do you need from the central office? They wouldn't think, oh, I need a boss who has a span of control of eight to one, right? That's, that's probably the last thing on their mind, right? They want, we think the three things we said, they want clarity on what they're supposed to do. They want access to really high quality professional development and coaching, whether it's from somebody who has a span of control of eight to one or 15 or 20 to one, they don't care as long as it's high quality and, and meets their differentiated needs. And then the other thing they, they talk about is we really need a relationship with the central office that allows us the time and resources to be instructional leaders because it's great if you make it clear what we're supposed to do. It's great if we get professional development. But if I only have three to five hours a week to do that work, we're still not going to get very far. So the third action area I just want to walk you through briefly really calls out the things that central offices can do to make it so principals can be instructional leaders, you know, if not all day, most of the day. And, and the rationale for this is, you, you can guess it, one, principals need more time for instructional leadership. Two, principals always, don't always know what they need from the central office. I think they're very limited by what central offices currently offer. So they're just happy if they get a response to an email or a call back. They don't have this wide dream of, of what could be. Thirdly, uh, we know that compliance and monitoring from the central office is, are not the same as strategic partnership. And for those of you who work in the central office, we really believe this is central office has the potential to add value to schools. To not just you know, be responsive or efficient, but actually to make it so principals are, are more effective and schools are more successful. Uh, the work in this area, we have a couple of really cool, we had to, to be honest, we had to go outside of education to look for the best stuff on what would be helpful to a central office when they change. So of course we got lots of input from people like you in some, some of the more innovative central offices around the country. We also looked at the education thinkers and researchers out there, places like the, the uh, Human Capital, uh, Betsy Aaron's work at the Human Capital Academy, the Wallace Foundation, Two of our partners in Seattle, the District Leadership Design Lab and the Center for Reinventing Public Education, are always putting out fascinating stuff on the central office. But we also looked at more of the sort of pop business literature, for lack of a better word, on adaptive change and what organizations do and look like when they're changing to different scenarios and contexts in which they're working. And then thirdly, there's a lot of great things, the healthcare field, uh, the lean startup work, all of that has been very influential uh, to inform what we think central offices can and should be doing. So I just want to take two minutes and paint a picture of, of a new central office for you. Imagine one that provides differentiated service to schools and principals. And not just one department doing that, but all departments. Two, that's proactive, that isn't waiting by the phone for a principal to call but out there side by side with principals trying to figure out what they need and how to provide it. Central office that adds value. A central office that's a truly a learning organization that is out there learning from what they're doing, trying, taking risks, prototyping, making mistakes, and then learning from that. And then la and lastly, one that's efficient and integrated across department, not siloed. And so what we're learning there First of all, we've done a survey of central office leaders, tremendous empathy from the central office about how hard the work of the principal is. But all, all people can think of is, I'm going to be really responsive. And we now know empathy and responsiveness are not enough. Principals need real strategic thought partners thinking through their human capital dilemmas, thinking through how to best use their, best use and uh, commingle their budgets for, for, uh, to meet their needs, things like that. Uh, we also know that the central office needs agreement on what the principal role is. Did a survey, six central offices, and lo and behold, even in places that have the double Gates Wallace uh, investments, still a wide variety of answers when we ask central office managers, what's the role of the principal between CEO, building leader, and instructional leader? 
Hill Hillsborough County is our outlier, where 80% of central office managers, not just instructional people, check the box, principal is an instructional leader. But, but they're an outlier. Uh, we're finding central offices such as Aspire, uh, Charter Management Organization, Green Dot, the CMOs are a little bit better at this, have systems for continuous improvement within their central office functions, and they take that seriously. Uh, and then lastly, not surprisingly, we're learning there's still central office silos. Uh, four out of the six districts that responded to our survey, uh, over half of the people responded they would not know who to call in another department for support other than their own department. And then lastly, no surprise, if teachers need professional development, principals need professional development, then it holds that if you want people in the central office to work very differently than they're currently doing, they need professional development as well. They can't just be hired and be given a manual. They need constant opportunities to, to learn how to work differently. And, and I think with that, I think what we'd like to do is, I, I, we have a hunch, you probably have a lot of questions for, for Judith and Kim in particular. So I think uh, this is probably a good time to open the floor. There's a mic. You can ask any of us a question and, and we're happy to do our best to respond to them. Go ahead, don't be shy. These guys are really smart. How are you? That's not on. Are we on? Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, I can hear myself, and I'm sure you can hear me too, but mm -hmm. they probably want to hear me at some point, or maybe not, but too bad. Um, I'll keep going on if you do that. My question is, you know, as an evaluator of, of other administrators, I'm just wondering, um, you know, and really valuing the role of a coach, I'm wondering if the two of you do both of those roles, and how do you, if you do, how do you negotiate with your um, people that you're supervising those two different hats, if you will, because um, it's not necessarily how I behave, but it's how the message is received from that person, which can be very different. So, thoughts? So, Kim does not do both. She is strictly a coach. I, however, am responsible for both. Um, one of my greatest strengths is the, the ability to build a team and build relationships. And so I always operate from a place of transparency. So for me, evaluation is last. Like, it's the last thing I'm concerned about. We set goals at the beginning of the year. We work toward those goals. For as successful as I am, is as successful as the principal is going to be. So I always tell them that, look, when the deal goes down, I'm going down with you. So we can't go down. So you have to have real relationships when you, when you engage. But I'm very transparent about the work because everything we do is on behalf of children. And so every decision we make has to be the best decision. And so when things go well, we celebrate those things. When things don't go well, we celebrate the little pieces that did go well and we talk about how to fix them. But when I find that as long as you're transparent, and I've been in a situation where I've, I've had principals that are no longer there and I've assisted in that process, they knew before we got to that process that that was the process we were gonna go down. Because I'm gonna stand right here side by side, but the moment you make a decision that you cannot do what's good for children, we're gonna work through that. And that might be helping you find something else to do. So I think transparency is clear. The one thing I will say is that you can't wait till the end of the year to evaluate. You're, you're looking, every time I go in the building, I'm looking for the standards. Every opportunity we have, we talk about what standard that relates to. I shouldn't be a supervisor at the end of the year trying to figure out, well, rate yourself and let me think about your ratings to know where you stand. That should be a conversation we're having all year long to make you better, for you to identify and work through those things and us coach and work together so that by the time we get to the end, we already know what your rating's gonna be. So it's, it's not a shock, it's not a surprise. And I think that's one of the paradigms and shifts that has to change because then you're comfortable working in transparency along the way. And Judith's right, I, I don't evaluate, but I get them ready. Um, and I say we sing or swim together. So, you know, we're, we're in it uh, together, both the principal and myself as, as their coach, and I get them ready, uh, both in their mid-year progress and at the end. And I'm fortunate enough where my area soup involves me, um, both to sit in on their evals and also to, um, to do their goal setting with them, uh, especially the principals that I coach, because I get to know them better really than anyone. And so we can kind of provide that double layer of support. Um, and just like, she said it's, it's all about developing those relationships and they're very comfortable and honest in sharing um, their eval because we want them ultimately to be the best they can be so that they can help their teachers and helping all of our children. We, we get asked this question. So everywhere we go to work, 
This is one of the first questions we get asked, and, and, and it's a great question. And one thing we're finding is the clearer performance metrics are for principals and school improvement. So when principals know, hey, here's the goals I'm being held accountable for as a school, and here's our power standards, and here's how I'm doing, the easier that role becomes. It's sort of like Judith pointed out. But in systems where the system is not clear on how performance is measured, and it comes down to sometimes this arbitrary relationship between a supervisor and principal as to what their evaluation is, it, it, it clearly is a little bit more, it, it, it is trickier for sure. So Please. thank you all for sharing this most important work and helping us think through it. Uh, Max, you had a slide a couple slides ago where you were talking about a new vision for central offices and there were several bubbles that built, to each, built with each other. Thank you, it's that one. And I'm curious to know from our panelists if they have some specific examples of how their systems are being that vision already where there are differentiated services that proactively are supporting principals in a way that adds value that the principals really appreciate coming into the school building. Yeah, that's great, thank you. I, I've seen you ask questions before, so I assume it, was, it will be a good and challenging question. So uh, what's funny is right now, I, I would argue that we've seen this more with uh, charter management organizations and some smaller school districts. The CMOs have the opportunity of starting from scratch but now we have school districts, particularly through our Gates work, that are sort of uh, replicating what they've learned from others. So what it, when principals say to us, our central office adds value, uh, I'll, I'll give you a good example uh, of a, a, a human resources department that's taking this on. So it's, it's a district that's taken on uh, case managers for school districts, which many of them do. But in this district, the case manager is out at the school four times a year. Early in the year, they're checking in on things like, you know, everything from any of your staff pregnant? Are you gonna need a long-term sub this year? Is there anybody that you're identifying early on that we might have performance issues with? To what sort of openings are, are you expecting later in the school year? And uh, in this one scenario, I can tell you, I'll, I'll never forget uh, recently seeing this scene of two uh, HR case managers with different caseloads sort of arguing over a candidate in the screening pool. And it was a math teacher, a graduate of Purdue, uh, a math candidate of color. And they both were like, knew that their schools knew that, boy, if they could get a strong math teacher in their school and somebody who, who kids could relate to and might better relate to kids, they wanted to grab that for their principal. So instead of waiting for the principal to call and say, I have a math opening, can I shuffle through this pile of candidates? They had somebody there who was shuffling through it for them and then providing them uh, potential applicants. Uh, another example from, from another district where the uh, budget office does these uh, quarterly meetings, but they go out and all the money's on the table. So when a principal is saying, oh, I wanna use my special ed money for another special ed teacher, the, the budget officer said, well, let's look at your math scores. I have some ideas on how we might be able to get you another math teacher uh, using some of your special ed funds. Uh, uh, again, uh, assuming kids are being served well so that they could actually meet their school improvement needs as opposed to just shuffling money around. Um, I would add to that, we currently have HR partners um, for each cluster. So each cluster has an HR partner that works with them. They have gone out twice so far this year to every school in our cluster um, to do exactly what Max discussed and to already talk about what they foresee next year, what positions might we go away with because we do have SBB and things like that. So that's been one thing. We also have our um, Office of Continuous School Improvement that works with our schools through our data-wise process. And so each cluster, again, has their own person assigned to them to come work with the schools. So as an instructional director, I have an HR partner, I have an OCSI, um, partner, I have an evaluation ambassador, so this, I have a person specifically for my cluster from the evaluation office to help my schools move through the evaluation process, and I have a special education partner. 
Um, we are doing a central office conference. This will be our second annual central office conference this year where we're working with all our directors in all of central office to understand the level and the work at the schoolhouse. And we thought that this year we're gonna definitely do some problem practice for them to really understand why when a bus is late, the impact that has. If you have a special ed bus going home late two hours and a child's arriving home two hours late and they're on medication, why that has an impact. So I think last year was our first year and it was actually like life changing for them to really understand what that means to impact schools and the, and the challenge that we face to make that really happen. Um, when this role was created five years ago, our instructional directors became the default. So you know that little red staple button? It's like, oh, IDs can do it, uh, IDs can do it. And so you found that if we, we want to get to a place that when a principal calls, they get an answer without being redirected to 10 different places. So our best example of that is, um, I would say, our OCSI and our um, HR partner. So now we can, we can send a question, they find the answer, and they call us back to move the work versus us having to chase it down. So we've really started a lot in doing that work. Um, and I concur with both of you. Our HR partners have really um, stepped out there and have been much more proactive with our schools and our principals. I recognize some of you out there, too, from the uh, Urban School Human Capital Conference not too long ago. Yes, um, I was there, too. And um, my HR partners were there as well. Um, so we're really trying, uh, putting a heavy push on recruiting minority applicants. And they're going out into our high schools and ways we can do that. That's a separate topic. Something that we're doing this year that is new for us, um, and we're excited about it, and it doesn't sound like that huge of an initiative, but I think it's really going to be helpful to the principals, is creating a district newsletter. So being so huge, you know, our principals are inundated with emails. I have a high school principals who get over 100 emails a day. And so they're going to make that a way of work that every certain time of week, it'll probably be like Tuesday at 5 o'clock, they get a newsletter from every single district office in one place with a message from the superintendent. And that will be archived and have links as well. And there'll be one person putting it out every week, so it'll be a consistent message. So other emails will not be, unless it's an emergency, will not be sent. And so we're gonna hold to that, and that's something that we're just rolling out right now. New York City, I know, does a nice job, if any of you are here from there. Um, I've looked at some of your samples. You do a great job with that. And so we're looking to uh, roll that out this year, and I think that'll be a helpful way to save up some time for our principals so they can get it back out there in the classrooms. That's great. Thank you. Uh, sadly, our time is up. Do, do you do the uh, final farewell? <laughs> well, I just want to make sure we thank Kim and, and Judith for their uh, participation today. I don't, they're worthy of a clap from you guys, I think. <laughs> There, there's some information here on, on just some upcoming uh, institutes we're leading if you're interested in learning more. Please, if you didn't get materials or if you want to get, we put out a lot of great free stuff. Come just give us your name and email, and I'll pass it back to you, Karen. I just want to thank um, our wonderful panelists, um, Max, Steve, Judith, and Kim, and I think they all deserve a big round of applause. Thank you for attending. Great information, and again, if you did not receive a packet, fill out one of these uh, sheets below with your name and email, and the Center for Educational Leadership will make sure you get the packets. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.